Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is my lecture on clinical assessment based on Chapter 3 of my book, Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy. And you may want to read along with the text uh, to help you through this lecture. So what is clinical assessment? Clinical assessment is something you do early in therapy uh, with clients that really focuses on examining their uh, psychological health using a psychiatric system of assessment that we use as well as attending to physical health dynamics. And clinical assessment is something that is really considered standard care, standard practice um, for all mental health professionals. And some of the basic things that happen in clinical assessment is monitoring for client safety and the safety of others, assessing for medical and psychiatric conditions, performing a mental status exam, making a diagnosis, and case management. Case management refers to kind of hooking the client up with various resources and referrals, whether they're medical, psychiatric, or community-based, to make sure they have everything they need to address whatever problems they might be facing. Now, one of the primary outcomes of a clinical assessment is to make a diagnosis. Now, in mental health, our diagnoses are um, found in the Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual, put out by the American Psychiatric Association. And these labels range from things like schizophrenia to major depression to adjustment disorders, substance abuse, that sort of thing. And, and the primary pur purpose of a mental health diagnosis um, and, and how they were all come up in the primary audience um, with whom they intend to serve is really psychiatrists. They're the ones who wrote the book, and so they really wrote the book for themselves to help them primarily with identifying which medications would be most useful in a clinical situation because they're anti-psychotics and antidepressants and anti-anxiety you know, anxiety medications and you can go through the DSM and find that that's how the book is actually organized. Now these labels are sometimes useful for mental health clinicians doing talk therapy like family therapists, psychotherapy, and sometimes these are not the most helpful labels. And so when we start looking at clinical assessment, it's definitely something that needs to happen um, but you need to keep in mind it may not be the most useful thing for how to conceptualize what you are going to do with this client. Um, so it, it potentially helps identify a course of treatment, but not necessarily the most, may not be the main thing that you're focusing your treatment around. It certainly can help you determine whether or not you need to refer out for psychiatric evaluation or medical evaluation or for other types of services. Um, there may be some evidence base around whatever diagnosis there is that can be helpful in designing treatment, but it isn't always the most useful way for therapists. And that's where stepping back and doing that case conceptualization from Chapter 2 really gives clinicians the full picture when they put their case conceptualization together with their diagnosis. That's when you really have the big picture about how to best conceptualize treatment. So some things to remember when you think about a mental health diagnosis. Um, is that many of the descriptions, many of what things that are in the book, um, are more descriptions of syndromes, clusters of symptoms, rather than discrete medical conditions. And actually, research is pretty clear that most clients actually have a vague mix of several of these um, disorders, rather than being a clear, clean and clear textbook case. Like many people with depression have a lot of generalized anxiety type symptoms. Um, and so, so you, so you need to take some of this, you know, uh, with a grain of salt also knowing that you, oftentimes clients don't really cleanly and neatly fit into one category or the other. Even though we've, you know, medical science has found some physiological basis for, for many of these disorders, it doesn't mean that there isn't also a lot of overlap because you'll find that, you know, often antidepressants work for anxiety, medic, um, anxiety clients. I have clients with depressive disorders that seem to respond to antipsychotics better than antidepressants. And so it's a lot vaguer in practice than it is uh, clean meat as in the textbook. The other thing to remember is that diagnoses really do rely very heavily on the subjective interpretation of the person making the diagnosis as to what's normal, what's not, what's impairment, what's not. This is especially true with children um, who have a range of developmental considerations when you're making diagnoses. And so it's very interesting. Oftentimes you'll find that uh, diagnosis is more of an art than a science. You can send the same client to three different psychiatrists or three different therapists, 
and you can often come up with totally different set of diagnoses from each person, each one very sure that they're correct. And so that's just something to keep in mind when you're looking at a mental health diagnosis. And I, I think for clinicians, for therapists, for family therapists, psychotherapists, that these diagnostic descriptions are really one of several possible descriptions about the problem that are going to be useful for you in terms of how you move forward with the client. Now in terms of a family therapy or systemic view of diagnosis, um, family therapists have historically actually had a fairly difficult um, relationship with the whole concept of diagnosis because family therapists have historically looked at a person's symptoms and behaviors as belonging to and part of and created in part by their context, their web of relational, um, of their web of relationships and their social network. And that basically in, because of the context, the person's problems and symptoms take a certain form. For example, in, in one context, a particular person may develop depressive symptoms where theoretically if you put them in a different family constellation, they may have more anxious symptoms or schizophrenic symptoms and that it's not all within the person, that the symptoms actually have meaning within the relational system that they're a part of. Also, family therapists have looked at the homeostatic role of um, symptomatic behavior. And so they're looking at that a given person's symptoms actually help maintain homeostasis in a family system. And generally, it helps keep the family from entering into a state of crisis. And so, you know, historically, one of the classic, you know, interpretations of this is that a child may develop symptomatic behavior to refocus a parent's attention onto the symptomatic child and away from the marital distress. And as crazy as this hypothesis sounds, and as formulaic as it sounds, I have often found, much to my amazement in um, my early practice as a therapist, that this is frequently the case. That often as one child's, as I get the child's symptoms to get better, they're less depressed or they're acting out less. That as that gets better, that the, parent, that the issues in the marriage often surface. And um, so it's a kind of hard to believe, at least for me, it's been very hard to believe that. But it's a dynamic that you often see, and so that's the symptom serving a homeostatic role. And so in the end, that family therapists and there are looking at how the individual's symptoms, even their physiological symptoms that may develop, you know, for example, with depression, you will, might probably will have lower levels of serotonin and norepinephrine, that all that is bound up with their relational contacts. And there's increasing brain research to show that this happens even in infants that our biochemistries, especially our brain um, patterns and interactions, are very much correlated with our relationships and our environment, and that we are much more even physiologically connected to our context than is we have traditionally thought of ourselves. And so from a family therapy perspective, when a person, when you're seeing symptomatic behavior, psychiatric type symptoms in a, in a client, you always want to look at that within the larger web of relationships, and why does this symptom make sense and this person's life context at this time in history. And, and when you start looking at it from a much broader perspective and how their symptoms make sense in a big picture of their relationships, you often get new clues and ideas about how best to proceed with the client in resolving them. Now, when you start looking at the newer postmodern therapists, and there are many family therapists who fall into this postmodern perspective, that they have a very, even more difficult relationship with diagnosis because they see that diagnostic labels tend to inform a person's identity about who they are, and often not in a good way. So for example, and often they make therapy hard, um, harder, more difficult to happen. So for example, a client comes in and they're saying, you know, I feel down, I feel blue, I'm just not myself anymore. And so this is how the client is actually describing their problems. Well, the postmodern therapist would work with those labels, feeling blue, not myself anymore, feeling down, in the dumps, um, use that language rather than talk about the client's perhaps major depressive disorder. And the reason that postmodern therapists do this is that they think that once you give them a medical diagnosis, that for many people that uh, makes it much more 
um, reifies it, makes it much more rigid, concrete, and it feels much like they have a lot less agency in terms of how to deal with it. Because now I have a medical condition, and we all know in our culture, the way it goes, you've got a medical condition, you need professionals to help you get out of it. You're pretty helpless, and, and so you're all of a sudden kind of moved into this very kind of helpless um, role, victim role in your life. Where, for example, if you keep the description of the problem is, I'm just not myself anymore, I've been down in the dumps and feeling blue, you can pick any one of those, and how, how do you think you get back to feeling more like yourself? How do you go to feeling less blue? Um, you can even have fun and say, how do I go to feeling green or even yellow? Um, and, and so using these alternative descriptions, using the client's natural language to describe the problem, postmodern therapists think that they can help clients to be much more proactive and active in making changes much more quickly than when you use the, the medical nomenclature of diagnosis major depressive disorder. And so instead, postmodern therapists really work on using client-generated descriptions of the problem, um, believing that the diagnosis is usually not as helpful as a client-generated description, and often not as clinically useful and, um, as a client-generated description. Also, in narrative therapy, they will sometimes to externalize the problem as something that they need to be in dialogue about. And you will see this actually done, and here they do use the diagnostic or psychiatric uh, languaging of anorexia and bulimia. And they have these anti-anorexia bulimia leagues, and they talk about how the client um, relates to anorexia as an external third party, almost like the disease is an entity uh, that has a life of its own that has kind of come in and to kind of talk the patient into the behaviors that the person is having. You know, that said, there are times, too, and, and typically um, there are times when actually the diagnostic label might reduce stress for some people. And the primary diagnosis where I, I find that liber where the diagnosis is actually liberating tends to be post-traumatic stress disorder is the most common one, where someone who has been sexually abused or in a a physically abusive relationship, and when you explain to them what post-traumatic stress is and how it makes their uh, irrational, quote-unquote irrational fears or hypervigilance make sense or how it makes their nightmares make sense and why they weren't afraid for a while and now they are, why the memories are coming back, and oftentimes post-traumatic stress um, is a diagnosis that many clients find liberating in the sense of of, oh, all of a sudden all this makes sense. So the whole piece on when to use it and what it means to client varies dramatically. And I think the bottom line that I want, to, want you to get from all of this is that there are times when using that diagnosis is the least clinically useful thing you can do. And there are people who feel very much imprisoned. And, and I, I can tell you right now, I've had a client on my caseload for a year and a half. And the primary thing we're trying to do is get her to not to not feel imprisoned by bipolar. She actually is stabilized on medication and could otherwise live a perfectly normal life, but she feels so trapped by this diagnosis and is so obsessed with it, really, that it really keeps her from living a very rich and full life, which she is, would be otherwise be fully capable of, of doing. So to kind of sum it all up again, to take a step back and kind of pull all this together, if you want to have a general MFT approach to diagnosis, I think the best way to sum that up is that any given diagnosis becomes one of many possible truths about the client, and that these truths are very much contextualized within the relationships and social discourses um, that the person is a part of. And so, and so there's a whole range of how you know, a therapist might use a diagnosis in session to actually be useful to the client in helping them get their lives in a, moving in a positive direction. In some cases, you might be using the diagnosis to, very centrally in the treatment, and in other cases, it's going to be very peripheral and not the focus, not the way that you're constructing the course of treatment. And so it's very important to be very flexible in terms of how you use this and to also be very aware that when you see a client displaying psychiatric symptoms, to remember that this is very much part of the whole broader system of which the client is a part, and then in another context, they might their symptoms might look very different. Now, when we talk about diagnosis, it's very important to also know um, on a political side what, the, what a parity diagnosis is. 
An aparity diagnosis refers to a mental health diagnosis that insurance companies are required by law to reimburse at a similar rate as a physical diagnosis, and hence they call it a parity diagnosis. Because in California and about 11 other states had had this these types of laws for a while, and it wasn't until 2008 that there was federal legislation requiring all states to have parity diagnosis reimbursement. Um, and these these uh, parity diagnoses are for mental health diagnoses that are believed to have a very strong phys physical component and also one that has a very direct impact on physical health. And so some of these, uh, the typical parity diagnosis, uh, this is true for the state of California, include anorexia and bulimia, bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, pervasive developmental disorders, schizoaffective and schizophrenia, and any major mental health diagnosis in children, including adjustment disorders. So with children, there's going to be a much broader coverage. For example, they will cover ADHD in kids, but they do not, ADHD in adults is not considered a parity diagnosis. So there are some differences between children and adults um, with these uh, diagnoses. But this is very important to know when you're doing billing, especially for insurance companies, because there's a very different rate of reimbursement for a parity diagnosis. And also, in most cases, they cannot limit treatment for a parity diagnosis unless they're doing the same type of limiting of the treatment for physical disorders. And so, you know, when you have a client who has a parity diagnosis, generally you have unlimited sessions for that time period, where if it's not a parity diagnosis, you'll typically find a time limit, the old HMO model, you have 25 sessions or whatever it is. And so that's where, the, that's where this parity diagnosis is very, very important. Now the other big thing that's happened uh, in terms of the world of diagnosis recently is kind of this um, surgence of the recovery approach and which relates to how diagnosis is conceptualized and more importantly to the type of prognosis we assign to any given diagnosis. So the recovery approach kind of comes out of 30 years of research um, from the World Health Organization. And what the World Health Organization found, they studied cultures across the globe, you know, first world nations, third world nations. They uh, surveyed people in mental health institutions, out of mental health institutions. And what they found across the board um, was that 26% of people who were diagnosed with severe mental health disorder, so that's like bipolar, schizophrenia, or major depressive disorder, um, that these people, 26% of them, achieved a full recovery um, within a five-year period, I believe was the time period they were looking at. So there were no symptoms. So this means that someone who was schizophrenic was no longer schizophrenic. Someone who was bipolar was no longer bipolar. Now, this is really phenomenal outcome because in the U.S., in most first world countries in which, you know, we're using the diagno DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, uh, who are you practicing modern psychiatry as we know it, modern therapy as we know it, our party line is pretty much, oh, once you're schizophrenic, you'll be taking your antipsychotic medications for life. Oh, once you're diagnosed with bipolar, you'll be taking your, you know, mood stabilizers for life. You cannot get off of those. Um, we see it pretty much as a life sentence. And what's phenomenal is that they found 26% of the people had full recovery. So just from the get-go, this is... a, a Pretty, um, pretty much shakes up what a lot of what we've been doing um, to this point in um, modern mental health treatment. They also found that 52% achieved a full social recovery. And what that means is they're fully, they have meaningful jobs, meaningful social relationships. They may need to be on medication or they still may need some therapy or social su support services, but overall they're functioning well. So this is, that's, this is just, this is, this is what's been going on across the globe all different social economic status, status uh, cultures, ethnicities. So this is pretty phenomenal outcome that really quite makes basically stakeholders from the outside were questioning what are you mental health people doing and saying, why are you saying that these bipolar and schizophrenic people have to be hospitalized or be on medication um, for the rest of their lives because that's not what's actually happening out there when you take a broad survey of people. The other interesting research is the open dialogue research in Finland. And ba basically, about 25, 30 years ago, Jaakko Sekula, a 
a Finnish psychiatrist um, who worked in the Lapland region of Finland. So and it's all socialized medicine. So anyone who has a psychotic disorder comes through this hospital if you live in the Lapland region of Finland. And he developed, he, he adopted a postmodern collaborative therapy approach using reflecting teams. And he came out with some phenomenal research um, that kind of shows when you have recovery orient, oriented perspective and attitudes and some of that postmodern view of let's not use the diagnostic criteria but the client description of what's going on. He came out with phenomenal results um, over the last 25 years. Um, what they have found using their approach that 83% return to work within two years and at 77 percent achieve a full recovery within two years. That means they're not on medications and they're fully, you know, functioning socially. So that means if we actually change how we interact with people and how we think about diagnosis, that um, what used to be considered incurable, like schizophrenia, that we can have a 77 percent full recovery rate. I mean, that's, that's phenomenal. It's actually unthinkable and really makes all of us have to sit back and say, whoa, what are we doing and can we really achieve better results? But the thought of schizophrenia being curable in our lifetimes is really, I mean, it's been unthinkable for most of us who's been in the field for a while. And um, it's a very exciting prospect that people are looking at very seriously. Now, in terms of the U.S., um, in 2004, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services formally adopted you know, a recovery approach, which basically meant they sent a memo to all county mental health agencies saying, hey, you guys should be doing this. But they didn't send any of the money to go along with that. So in California at the same time, um, a, a Prop 63 was on the ballot and it passed and it is now known as the Mental Health Services Act. And California became the first state to pass legislation to fund recovery-based mental health programs. So in California, the largest source of funding now for mental health, public mental health is the Mental Health Services Act. So that's for many jobs for people <laughs> new into the field are going to find um, in California are funded by this money. And it's, it, the, the funding only goes to new programs that are recovery based, kind of using this definition. And in 2009, the California MFT license became the first mental health license to actually add recovery orientation or recovery training to the curriculum. And that will take effect for, in all MFT programs in 2012. So to define recovery, now that we've been talking about it for a while, um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in their 2004 initiative defined recovery as a journey of healing and transformation enabling a person with a mental health problem to live a meaningful life in a community of his or her choice while striving to achieve his or her full potential. So basically what they're saying is that recovery means we are no longer focusing so much on reducing those psychiatric symptoms. And we're, not, we're not focusing on the diagnosis anymore. We're focusing on helping the person live a rich and full, meaningful life. And so in many ways, this definition fits with what postmodern therapists and what systemic therapists have been saying, is that mental health treatment should not be focusing on reducing psychiatric symptoms as much as it should be focusing on helping the person live a rich, meaningful life. And, and so... For family therapists, and this is probably one of the reasons the MFT license were one of the first to adopt this formally into their curriculum, is that this really fits with the marriage family therapy view of what psychiatric symptoms are and how they play out, which is really a minor role in helping the client live the life that they need to be living. And again, that kind of goes back to psychiatric symptoms and diagnostic labels are truly most useful for psychiatrists identifying psychiatric meds, mental, marriage family therapists still need to do all the diagnosing and assessing and thinking of those clinical issues so they know whether or not to refer out for psychiatric help. There may be times when those psychiatric labels can, and symptoms can be very helpful you know, in conceptualizing part of treatment, but it's not the key and it's not the primary direction in which family therapists um, are focusing their energy. So um, to kind of wrap up here with um, recovery, there are 10 fundamental components. Um, and the first is self-direction, that the client is the one who directs treatment. And in terms of deciding what they want to try next and what types of treatment elements they think will be helpful and what they don't. There's a lot of focusing on individualizing the treatment. And the treatment is very much what they call person-centered. This is not referred to Carl Rogers whatsoever but it's person-centered compared to disease-centered. 
So we're no longer treating the disease, but the human who has been diagnosed with the disease, quote unquote. So it's very much focusing on the person and not reducing symptoms. It's focusing on empowerment, empowering the client to take action in their lives. It's a very holistic perspective in terms of looking at the whole person spiritually, you know, looking at their housing needs as well as their mental health needs. It's nonlinear, that it's a two steps forward, one step back and to the side type of thing. And that recovery from mental illness, um, it, it's a bumpy road. And you're going to go see, you know, have progress and setbacks and to be ready for that. The focus is also, also strengths-based. Um, and that means that clinicians who are working with clients focus on what can they do? What are their resources and how do we harness that? Peer support is very central, so other people with mental health issues working side by side with those struggling with them, whether um, working with someone who's kind of recovered from mental health illnesses or someone who's also still struggling, that peer support is very central. That it's essential that um, the persons working with those diagnosed with mental health illness res are respectful in their language and in their attitudes. Responsibility, it's important that the person who's diagnosed with a mental health illness takes the primary responsibility for getting better. The clinician or therapist should not be the one who's got the primary responsibility for making things change. And that the whole process is very much built on hope. And that often is, falls upon the therapist to be the one who holds out hope for the client when they don't believe there is any. Now, in terms of how to approach a clinical assessment, how to do one, um, there are two general approaches, which I do detail in a lot more um, specifics in the book. One is a systemic approach, um, the other is the postmodern. And in the systemic approach, you would use problem assessment, which starts um, identifying the interaction cycle in which the symptoms occur. And so here you'd be not only tracing the behavioral sequence, which is typical in marriage family therapy systemic approaches, you know, A, Person A said X, said whatever, and B said Y, and then A responded in this way, and B responded in that way, and you trace all of that through till you get back to homeostasis. But while doing that, you would also be asking about psychiatric types of issues, such as mood, such as eating, such as sleep, and kind of tracing that whole pattern out while looking at all the clinical types of issues. Similarly, circular questions can also be used to help flesh out these interaction cycles. In the postmodern approach, um, you can use the, the narrative uh, mapping the influence of persons and the influence of problems to identify, again, some more of the clinical um, issues. So when you map the influence of problems, you're looking at how the problem has affected the person's life. And here you're going to get a lot of clinical symptoms. So you would ask about, you know, not only how, how has it affected their relationships, how, how has the problem affected their sleep and their eating and their moods, and... And so you would go through that, and you can, using the narrative approach, to collect a lot of clinical assessment data. Similarly, you can go back and look at, map the influence of persons on the problem. So when are there times you've kept the problem from affecting your mood, or kept the problem from affecting your sleep or eating or your relationships? So you can use these very standard uh, narrative therapy questions to do a full clinical assessment. And so these questions help you monitor the effects of, in different areas of functioning while using a language that's going to be very consistent with how you conduct the rest of treatment. And again, all of this is lined, outlined in a lot more detail in Chapter 3 of Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy. Now, in addition to, to kind of doing a verbal uh, clinical assessment, you can also do a formal written assessment. And there are standardized assessment instruments that help um, therapists collect this type of data the most extensive of which is the MMPI, um, which is a pretty extensive test. And there's also shorter tests like the Beck Depression Inventory or the MAST for substance abuse, um, which are shorter instruments that can help clinicians, you know, assess depression or anxiety or substance abuse. The pros of these is that they are standardized, which means that they have been tested and that they are tested against national norms. Now, sometimes these norms are have cultural diversities accounted for in social economic class, and in other cases, they're not. Um, generally, standardized assessments are considered more accurate. Um, but, but again, that kind of de depends on whether or not your client matches the demographics for which the test was developed. Um, 
this is but the standardized assessment is particularly helpful when there are multiple and severe symptoms that you're trying to make a differentiated diagnosis um, and, it, and the treatment is not uh, working and not going forward and you're trying to figure out what's going on. Now the cons of formal uh, written assessments is that there is no clear link to actually improved outcomes so you can put a lot of time and money into doing doing an MMPI but it may not necessarily result in a better clinical outcome at least for those doing day-to-day -day therapy in your standard community outpatient clinic. Um, and so also times um, that the standardized assessments may not fit with a the therapist's theoretical orientation. And these, like I said, are often more difficult to use with diverse populations. They do cost, some of them do cost a lot of money, and they do require time and effort to administer. And that's time and effort both on the part of the therapist and on the client. Now another option therapists have are the informal written assessments. And these tend to be self-report measures. Any therapist can write up a checklist of symptoms and the client can fill those out. Um, and the pros of are, of course, that these are very inexpensive. They're easily adapted to fit with the therapist's theoretical approach. Um, they can be more appropriate for use with diverse clients. And generally, there's a lot less time required for administering these. The cons are they may not capture more subtle clinical issues. Um, that the effectiveness is really determined by the therapist's level of skill and that generally self-report is considered less accurate than what would be um, the data collected on a standardized instrument. Now in terms of writing up your clinical assessment, um, Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy includes a sample written clinical assessment. It's pretty standard when you look at what insurance companies are using or what um, county mental health agencies are using. And Compared to mental health assessments 10 years ago, there's a lot more check boxes, which in some ways makes life easier for us. Um, and, and it's more, much more standardized than 10, 20 years ago. So most clinical assessments, and you can go to the book for an example of what this looks like, uh, would include demographics. So that's going to be, again, the client um, ID number and whoever is participating in session. And again, we're trying to avoid putting client names on clinical documents as much as possible. You generally have the age, the birth date, the profession, and the year or the year that they're in school. Any um, important ethnicity or language issues are generally also noted right up front. And then generally there's a section where you identify what the presenting problem is. You could put in, use a hand write it out, or as this form has, you have a checkbox. Um, this is what the client is saying that they need help with, and that's the presenting problem. Now the next section is actually the mental status exam. And, and in this version, it's a check sheet version, which I think many people find easier to fill out than the, the handwritten version. Um, and for marriage family therapists, it's very important that you always address what the interpersonal issues are. And on this form, that's in the first box, because that helps you make sure that you're within your scope of practice. Are there, is there any effect on interpersonal functioning? And generally, you need that answer there to be some kind of effect there for for, for the case to be within a scope of practice. When you look at moods, here you're looking at emotions like depression, anger, and these are what clients are feeling within themselves. And that is compared to affect, which is more the outer expression of emotion. And when you get to this section, I want you to, to be particularly clear when you start looking at um, constricted expression of emotion versus a flat expression of emotion. Flat is generally associated with psychotic symptoms, and I always say you know when you're sitting with someone with a flat affect because you almost, for me, I almost get a chill down my spine, but there, there is so little response, and it is so incongruent with what's going on that um, it's a very distinct way of being. Where constricted just means that there's a lot less emotional expression than you would be expecting, and blunt is even more than that. And so you'll be choosing constricted or blunted if it's um, very much, it's not a psychotic type of expression of emotion, but much more, just far more restricted than we would typically expect. And so this is a common mistake I see a lot of new therapists make, like, this person doesn't express any emotion, I'm going to give them flat. And I'm like, if you've got flat checked, we're generally expecting to see um, more psychotic types of features down below where, where constricted or blunted kind of um, is more within the normal range you would see with depression or anxiety types of issues. 
Of course, you'll be looking at sleeping and eating patterns, and those, you know, new therapists get, need to get really used to that you always ask about sleeping and eating in that first session. Um, as part of understanding what might be going on in terms of making a mental health diagnosis, because even though these are kind of physical issues, they definitely are correlated and are a criterion for several mental health diagnoses. Anxiety symptoms, psychotic symptoms, you'd look at motor activity and thought processes as part of their mental status exam. And all of these, whatever you're checking here, should be very closely correlating whatever diagnosis you come up with. Now in terms of making a diagnosis, most mental health diagnoses follow the five axis system in the DSM. And the first axis is the focus of treatment with all your general uh, mental health conditions minus what's on axis two, which are the personality disorders and mental retardation. And so those two axes come straight out of the DSM. Axis three is any medical conditions. And here I generally will put, you know, as reported by either the client um, or an MD, or is diagnosed by, and put the, the MD's name down if you if you have that written documentation. But generally, you would put you know reported by client as in you know cholesterol issues as reported by client on this line. Um, since we aren't actually running the mental um, the physical tests. In terms of access four, those are the psychosocial stressors and environmental conditions, and these can be things like financial stressors. Stressors in the primary support group, difficulty accessing medical services, legal issues, those types of psychosocial stressors. And the fifth access is where you get the GAF score. That's the Global Assessment of Functioning. And I'm just going to get straight to the point here because this is often another area where new clinicians often have a lot of difficulty getting a correct GAF score. So I'm just going to kind of, kind of, tell it to you straight about how to do this. So, first thing is, is that anything with a score of 70 and above is normal range of functioning. They are not eligible for insurance reimbursement. They're generally not eligible for treatment. They're generally the, you know, the worried well, some people might call them, but they're, they're, they're functioning. They're okay. They're doing okay, and they're just generally going through fairly normal life stress transitional types of issues. And so, this is very important that once you hit 70, insurance will not pay for it. And so when you're working with third-party payers, you unfortunately need to keep this in mind. And that's just the standard. And, and so you're not lying to know this or, you know, some people, oh, that's deceptive. And I'm like, well, if you're going to have them in treatment and you believe that they need it, their GAF score should then be below 70. That's what the GAF score actually means. And it's not mean. I, I know some people want to encourage their clients and be upbeat and positive and hopeful. But you don't do that when you're doing it with your GAF score, okay? You save that for the sessions, but when you're doing your GAF score, you need to be using the standards that everyone else is using so people know what you mean with these numbers because these numbers are not wild or random. They're very closely correlated to what type of symptoms we, we should expect the client to have and also kind of a code language for saying whether or not they actually need to be in treatment. So mild symptoms are between 60 and 69. And many outpatient clinics, most of the clients seen in outpatient clinics should be moderate to mild. Increasingly, you do see severe symptoms, um, but 60 to 90 are mild symptoms. So, so that means that they may have depressed, they may qualify for major depressive disorder, um, but they're generally still going to work. They're just miserable most of the time while they're doing it. Where you get to moderate, that's 50 to 59, so this is moderate functioning. These, um, for again, stick with the depression diagnosis, they may have a lot more difficulty getting up out of bed. They may miss some days. They may have lost, you know, several friendships, um, be very socially isolated, um, but they're still feeding themselves and getting dressed and taking showers, okay? Now, when you get to severe, that's 40 to 49. Um, these are people who are barely out of the hospital. Like, you're watching them generally to see if they need to be in the hospital. Generally severe, they typically, most people would think, need medication. Um, and this is where they are having most likely suicidal thoughts. They are not getting out of bed regularly in the mornings. They are not taking showers regularly. Uh, they rarely feel good. Uh, they have few satisfying relationships. And their life is generally major components are falling apart at this point. 39 and below um, means that there's significant difficulty meeting their basic needs. 
they're generally serious safety issues and you're generally looking at hospitalization. Of course, insurance doesn't pay for a lot of hospitalization anymore, um, but this is where they're needing high level of services when you get to 39 and below. And then the last piece is the GARF, the Global Asses Assessment of Relational Functioning and his Family Therapist. It uses the same scale. There's a whole thing in the back of the DSM. But again, most of what we're seeing is going to be between 40 and 69 needing treatment. But this is just important for family therapists because that is part of our how we conceptualize clients is to look at how are they functioning in their relationships. Generally, this is pretty correlated to what's going on with their GAF score, um, but not always and not necessarily. And if you look at the DSM, they have a whole bunch of scales for occupational functioning and lots of good things. Um, that kind of work on this same basic 0 to 100 scale. So now once you have the diagnosis identified and you've gasped them and all, you're already on the road to getting a good sense of what type of risk assessment you need to be doing. But you generally need to be ruling out suicidal thoughts, homicidal thoughts, uh, substance and alcohol abuse, and this should be ruled out with all clients with all types of issues because it's and especially with alcohol and substance abuse, it's a type of assessment you want to routinely go back and check in on because oftentimes it's not caught at the first screening. People don't always describe accurately their alcohol and drug use, minimize it up front, but it's something you always want to have, keep, a, keep in the back of your mind and continually screen for. Child and elder abuse, domestic violence. Again, domestic violence is frequently missed by clinicians. And so again, it's another issue that you're constantly kind of assessing for in the background. Eating disorders and self-harm are common types of assessment issues that therapists need to, you know, both continually monitor for as well as document that they have been assessed. Now, when some kind of action needs to be taken, even if it's just asking more follow-up questions about suicide or child abuse, that that needs to be documented, especially if you call to make a child abuse report or you're making a call to 5150 a client, put them in the hospital, these types of things you want to make sure you detail um, in painfully, you know, detail these in your documents so that people know, A, how you determined a, the level of risk and what you did to protect the client and or the public from potential harm. And so this is where you you do the most docu heavy documentation with the most detailed description of what you did. So anyone can go back through and read that and say, given the information that this therapist had, they made a prudent decision about how to protect the client and the public. So now once you've got the diagnosis and you've done risk assessment, you've got a sense about where you're going, that's where you want to step back and ask, how do, what, are the, what elements does this client need to, um, to be successful? And what things besides just sitting in a room for 50 minutes and talking to me would this client need to be successful? And this is what we're going to call case management. It's the stuff that's happening outside sessions with psychiatrists and therapists. So the first thing is generally if there is a social worker involved, you need to be calling that social worker and um, comparing notes and coordinating treatment. You also need to be contacting any other medical or psychological professionals to coordinate treatment, especially psychiatrists and physicians who might be working on similar issues that you're working on. Um, you may need to refer out to have a psychiatric or medical evaluation to support your treatment, depending on what you discovered in your clinical assessment. There also may need to be referrals for additional social services, like for housing or food or group therapy or legal services. And so it's important that you know um, what type of services, generally low fee services, are in your area um, that might support your client. That you know they may need to get their housing or job situation nailed down in order to really focus on the issues that you're trying to deal with. And, in session and therapists are obliged to help clients meet these needs. Um, you also want to look in terms of dealing with any legal issues that might be going on with probation or if there are attorneys or workers comp or divorce cases. You want to be very mindful of coordinating these services right up front to know what you're getting yourself into. And the other thing you want to start looking look for is the, the connection with community and social supports. This is so important for mental well-being and so looking at can you hook them up with 
any type of religious group or their family members or friends or support groups that this client might need to be successful in meeting their goals. And it's important that we look at that support network because without it, it's not likely that they're either going to A, achieve their goals or B, be able to sustain them. And so the last part of the clinical assessment, um, you start look, start giving an overview of what the overall plan for treatment will be. And that's going to look at session frequency, the expected duration of treatment, the modalities, individual, family, couples, groups, the prognosis, whether we think they're going to return to their prior level or normal levels of functioning, and how involved the family is, especially in cases uh, with children or people with severe mental illness, that family involvement is highly correlated with positive outcomes. And so finally, in this particular version of a clinical assessment, you look at the evaluation of the assessment itself in terms of addressing diversity issues, systemic factors, and making sure that the client and therapist would actually agree on what is stated in this um, document about what's going on with the client's life. And it's important to note, and there are going to be times where there is a difference of opinion. You know, um, I have worked with a client who I was very sure had bipolar disorder, and she was very sure she did not. And, and that's, you know, a difference of opinion that does need to be documented. Um, but sometimes, you know, the therapist can share their opinion, the client can share theirs, and, and the greater understanding can happen between the two, and it can go either direction, but it's important to have that dialogue and discourse. So many clients have no idea what their therapist has diagnosed them with, and most codes of ethic require that we actually do that, so it's a very important dialogue to have with your clients. Um, what is the diagnosis? What does it mean for them um, in terms of treatment? And, and what does it mean for them in terms of the course of their life? So, so that is a brief introduction to clinical assessment. And each field placement you work at will have a different set of documents kind of related to this. Some may be uh, a lot shorter than this document. Some may be longer than this document. But generally, you're going to see the same components um, regardless of where you're at, either in abbreviated or more detailed versions. And some will be more handwritten, and some will use more check boxes. But you'll notice that the same areas are routinely assessed and reassessed on all clinical assessment documents. So hopefully this gave you a useful introduction to the concept of clinical assessment.